This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Ukraine conflict. It is February 23rd, 24th, 2014 at the Kremlin. A meeting that lasts all night involves the heads of state security, the GRU, the SVR, the FSB, plus the National Security Council, plus Vladimir Putin. And the decision that night is to annex and tear apart Ukraine. This scene is representative of the decisions made at the Kremlin without any permission of anyone outside, like a democracy or a parliament or representatives of government or people of the world, made unilaterally by Vladimir Putin and his state security chiefs, remembering always that Vladimir Putin's training is that of a Czechist, a member of the FSB, a secret policeman. This scene riveting is in a new book, The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History, by Professor Serhii Ploki. He is a professor of Ukrainian history and director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. This book, written between March of 2022, the month after the invasion, and February of 2023. The war is ongoing. It's more than 500 days, but the roots of it are critical to understand if we have the future. The professor reminds us that an historian is the worst possible interpreter of current events except for everyone else. Professor, I greet you. Thank you very much. What in that meeting illustrates a theme that runs through your book? This is a combination of events that are in contest, a war of national liberation, Ukraine, an imperial disintegration, Soviet Russian Federation. Good evening to you. Uh, good evening, and thanks thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, what uh, happened on the night of February 23rd, 2014, certainly demonstrates very clearly that uh, Russia today, even Russia back in 2014, nine years ago, was anything but a democracy. And uh, if you look closer at the story of that meeting, the story how it was uh, retold a number of times by Vladimir Putin itself, it's not just the decision made by the leader of the country and a small group of the um, security officials. It's really a decision made by one man. And that was, that was Vladimir Putin. So people there were not to advise him on the decision. People there were to advise him on how that decision that he had made had to be implemented. So we are, we are dealing really with dictatorship today. And this is um, a story of the um, transformation of Russia from uh, the times of the August coup in 1991 when Boris Yeltsin was on the tank defending what everyone believed was Russian democracy. And a few uh, years later, really a little bit more than two years, he ordered his tanks to fire the very same building of the Russian parliament that he defended. Uh, so that was the fall of 93. And a few months later, a new super presidential constitution was uh, proposed to the to the Russian public, approved, and that became the the foundational, the legal base for the uh, dictatorial powers of Vladimir Putin that we have today. Yes, and Boris Yeltsin is Vladimir Putin. You will all remember that in ninety nine, Yeltsin gave Vladimir Putin, a former KGB uh, officer the uh, power to conquer Chechnya. And that led to a series of violent events, including what is suspect, always has been suspect as a false flag operation of destroying apartments in Russia to justify the invasion and destruction of Grozny and much of Chechnya. So Putin gained his credibility with the Russian people by being brutal to the Chechens. However, we come to an, uh, events in Ukraine at the same time that are illustrative of how we got here. Uh, the Ukrainian constitution was also trimmed and rewritten in the mid nineties, um, balancing not between the executive branch, the president 
and the parliament, the Rada, but leaning heavily towards uh, the president, who at the time was a man named Kuchma. Professor, all Ukraine is divided into two parts, and it's important to understand those two parts now. There is the West, westward regarding uh, religion of Roman Catholic faith, or and there is the East, uh, eastward regarding towards Moscow of Eastern Orthodox. The Russian speaking in the East, the uh, very cosmopolitan in the West. Those are generalities. Do they hold up today, Professor? Thank you. Uh, this is certainly one of the stereotypes uh, of Ukraine that existed and existed for a long period of time. If you look at the religious map of Ukraine, you will find that the so-called Catholics are uh, really in a few Western regions of Ukraine. This is not half of Ukraine by any standard. And also the Catholics are so-called Greek Catholics. So there, this is um, a church that was created in the 16th century, and it's a hybrid church between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. So Ukraine is much more divided and uh, much more united so, sorry, than the this ideas of, of division uh, on, on the religious basis, linguistic basis, um, uh, really, really uh, presuppose. But whatever divisions were in Ukraine, they really uh, became politically very important in 2014. They were um, used by the and exploited uh, by uh, Russia after the annexation of the Crimea. Uh, the idea was to start also the, the hybrid war in uh, Eastern Ukraine in Donbass region. So the, the whatever tensions they existed, linguistic, cultural, religious, and otherwise, they were certainly exploited in 2014 and explain to a degree the relative ease with which Russia took over Crimea in 2014. Relative ease with which the war, the hybrid warfare was started in Eastern Ukraine. But what 2014, the start of the war did to the Ukrainian society, it actually produced the society much more unified than it ever existed before. And one of the biggest miscalculations and biggest mistakes of Vladimir Putin and his advisors, and I don't know to what degree he listened to his advisors, but the biggest mistake is that they invaded Ukraine in 2022, believing that it was still the country of 2014, when in fact, this uh, the shock of the takeover of the Crimea, the shock of the start of the war in the east of the country, united the country. In 2022, it was united around the, the figure of the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, who no one uh, expected that he would become, become a war leader of the country the, the, in, in such such difficult circumstances. So um, to a degree that Ukraine was divided before 2014, to the same degree it was united after 2014. And that, that was the change that uh, many in the world in general, but in particular in Moscow, failed to notice. Vladimir Putin has made the decision to annex Crimea and to fragment Ukraine, the night of 23, 24, 2014. There are several events that we need to touch upon that illustrate how it is that Vladimir Putin, a state security officer, believed he had the authority and the geopolitical sweet spot to make such a move, which has led to a catastrophe across the world. The professor is Serhi Ploki. The book is The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History. We are discussing the roots of it because that will somehow be present in when there is an end of it, or at least a ceasefire. Professor Vladimir Putin becomes critical here because it's his, his authority that drives the tragedy. He becomes president in May of 2000 with a constitution that empowers him, although it limits him to two terms. Later on, of course, that will become something he can manipulate because the presidency in Russia 
thanks to Boris Yeltsin, and vouchsafed by Bill Clinton, is much more powerful than our understanding of checks and balances here in the United States. That gives Putin the power uh, both to play the friend of the U.S. during the war on terror and also move towards the assumption that he has the right to dictate who can join NATO, who can join EU, who can be westward regarding, and who cannot. You identify April of 2008 as an important summit for NATO, in Bucharest. At that time, Georgia and Ukraine both wanted to join NATO. What happened? Uh, what happened was split within the alliance. Uh, the United States at that time, led by uh, President George W. Bush, was um, in favor of inviting Ukraine and Georgia joining the alliance. And uh, part of the Western allies, uh, in, particular, in particular Germany, opposed to this idea. So what happened as the result of the summit was the worst um, outcome possible for uh, Ukraine and Georgia. They invited to summit. Mr. Putin traveled to summit as well, trying to lobby the uh, European members of the alliance to say no to Ukraine and Georgia. At the end, alliance never, never reached an agreement. So there was a promise given to Ukraine and Georgia that one day they would become the member of alliance, but there was no specifics on when that day would come. But there were quite a lot of specifics in Mr. Putin's thinking about the whole issue. Within a few months after the Bucharest summit, he starts war in Georgia in 2008, invading the territory, and uh, really, really uh, de facto annexing parts of, of, of Georgian territory, making, making Georgia uh, uneligible to join an alliance because the country had a territorial, a territorial dispute because part of the territory of the country was, was under uh, de facto occupation. And uh, the war with Ukraine came um, six years later in 2014. So um, the, the, the outcome of Bucharest summit was that um, Ukraine and Georgia really counted on the Western support, went public about their desire to join NATO. And in that way, they exposed themselves to the uh, future Russian attack with really no, no guarantees, assurances, or even hope for, for uh, significant and meaningful uh, Western support. And when I say meaningful Western support, I mean, I mean military one with the, with the uh, uh, weapons and, uh, and equipment, not just a diplomatic one. The 2008 tearing apart of Georgia, a foreshadowing of what happens with Ukraine a few years later, happens during the presidential election cycle in the US. You will all recall that Barack Obama was successful and his vice president was, was Joe Biden. Joe Biden was in Ukraine that at that time and since then has been very well informed of Ukraine. However, uh, was in Ukraine and also visited Georgia during the conflict. I mention that also because there are many events we're moving past. There was internal debate in Ukraine always about eastward regarding or westward regarding. By 2013, it was very much the wish of Moscow, the intention, the ambition of Moscow to embrace Ukraine on the eastern regarding, having to do with the Eurasian Union. At the same time, the European Union was offering membership, at least preparation for membership to Ukraine and Georgia. This leads to the Maidan revolution of late 2013, early 2014. And we need to involve ourselves with a man named Yanukovych. What do we need to know about him? Because he acts so badly representing Ukraine. Was he an agent of Moscow? Was he weak? Is there any one explanation for his conduct in those months? Uh, Mr. Yanukovych uh, was... Um, uh, was running for the presidency of Ukraine in 2004. Uh, 
was backed by uh, not just at that time sitting president of Ukraine, Leonid Kuchma, but also by Vladimir Putin. I remember those days visiting Moscow and being shocked by the fact that the uh, propaganda for Yanukovych was the, the posters were uh, available, very visible in downtown Moscow. And uh, the uh, Ukrainian society actually rejected the falsified results of the elections that were supposed to give the presidency to Yanukovych. Out of that came the so-called Orange Revolution. And uh, that was viewed by President Putin not just as a, as a setback, that was viewed uh, by him as a threat to his, uh, to his power in Russia itself. If people can reject falsified elections, his days would be numbered. He wouldn't be here today if, if uh, the population of Russia would, would behave in the way how Ukrainians behaved in 2004. We have one minute, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, so Yanukovych loses. Democracy in Ukraine wins. But a few years later, in 2010, Yanukovych comes back, again, very much with the support of Russia. And in 2013, he is pressured by Russia and also bribed by the promise of 15 billion loan, bribed not to sign association agreement with European Union. And once again, Ukrainians actually are not prepared to accept what the uh, Yanukovych offers them. They want orientation toward Europe, toward European Union, and they they protest. That's the beginning of the so-called Euro Revolution or the Revolution of Dignity in the fall of 2013, which was a, a really a, a prelude, a stepping stone toward the annexation of the Crimea and the start of the war in 2014. The pro, the book is The Russo-Ukrainian War. Serhii Ploki is the author. The decision is made at the Kremlin by Vladimir Putin, his state security chiefs watching. On the 27th, what we call now the little green man appear, gunman in Crimea. A man named Aksenov is identified by the Kremlin as the to be the new prime minister of the Crimean parliament. This is very much an annexation by brute force of Crimea. The puzzlement now reading the professor's timeline here is what the US did, what NATO did, how they reacted to what was clearly an intention to brutalize and tear apart Ukraine. Professor, I know that there are second thoughts everywhere, but your measure today did NATO go along with the Crimean annexation because it was anxious about war? It was not ready to war. It hadn't anticipated that Putin would go that far. Why was there not the protest? I know there were sanctions, but not the protest at the level we see today with a similar brutality by Russia. Uh, I'm personally convinced that if reaction to the um, annexation of the Crimea would be on the same level as was the reaction to the start of the all-out war against Ukraine in uh, February of 2022, we would not have today this big war that Ukraine is fighting uh, with the help of its Western allies. So the question is why there was no such reaction. And uh, my explanation to that is by drawing historical parallel between the annexation of Crimea and Anschluss of Austria. And the reaction of the West, collective West, was more or less of the same kind. That yes, of course, this is this is a happy occurrence, but uh, isn't this a uh, fear that all the Germans have to live in one German state? Isn't this true that the majority of the population in the Crimea are Russian? Most likely Hitler would stop at annexation of the Austria and would not go further. Most likely this is an exception in Putin's behavior and he would not go further uh, after the Crimea because there are no other parts or regions of Ukraine or any country for that matter where the Russians would constitute the majority. 
that was, in my understanding, the, the main reason why the annexation of the Crimea was treated as, as a bump on the road to the future improvement of relationship. And Germany, in particular, starts building uh, North Stream uh, 2 after, after building Nord Stream 1, believing that the more economic ties are there with Russia, the less likely would be the escalation, the less likely would be a conflict of the sort that we have today. It was it was a mistake. Putin and the Kremlin deceived, and perhaps NATO wanted to be deceived, but the idea was we're only interested in taking back Crimea, which was given to the Ukrainians by Khrushchev. There is a lot of talk about what Lenin did or did not do about the new Russia. There was a lot of talk about history. However, the pretense was this is as far as we'll go. Immediately, there were provoked and driven so-called eruptions in Donetsk Oblast and Luhansk Oblast. We can see now clearly that those were concocted by Russian agents or sympathetic voices to Russia. And at the time, nothing was done challenging this, and Ukraine committed itself to a perpetual frontline war where 14,000 people died between the February, March of 2014 and the start of the invasion of Ukraine in 2022. So it wasn't a, a, a small matter. Again, though, it's the same mystery why the West stood by. Did, did NATO fear a larger war? Did they, did they express that at the time, the way they do now routinely, whenever there's a change in the weather in Ukraine? Uh, NATO not only uh, feared the, the larger war, that was certainly the case, but the entire policy of the NATO was to try to convince um, Russia that they were not only not thinking about the war, but they were incapable of fighting the war. The whole point was of pacifying Russia, not placing uh, any any uh, NATO military units too close to the borders, not just of Russia, but also of Ukraine as well. Not placing uh, um, US troops in particular in Eastern Europe. So when the annexation of the Crimea came in 2014, uh, it wasn't that only that NATO countries didn't want to respond. The problem was that they had very little to respond with. And it's only it's only later that we see the build up uh, of the of the NATO capacities and abilities in the region. Uh, the, the the process that is not fully complete till now. The, the latest uh, NATO summit in Vilnius, uh, for the first time, there were adopted three different plans uh, of defensive operations in Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm talking about July twenty. 23, we, we are in the, NATO is in the state of planning. Uh, can you imagine what, what the situation was back in 2013 or 2013? There are events here that are critical to play, to note uh, because they will play out in the future, but the deception of we're only interested in the Crimea quickly goes away. What the professor writes is that Putin sought a veneer of legitimacy, and it was vouchsafed by the NATO voices, by the United States at the time, by the Obama administration, with Joe Biden as president. We could see what was happening, however, and the Russians invaded in the summer of 2014. There's no other word for it. A massive Russian counterattack that led to the massacre of Ukrainian uh, forces that had been rallied to defend their country. This led to the second Minsk agreement. By that time, there was a president, a new president, a former oligarch and billionaire, a man named Poroshenko. And they met again in Minsk, the capital of Belarus, Merkel, Putin, Hollande, then president of France, and Petroshenko, and ag agreed to the Minsk II. Minsk II, was that a convenient Explanation for NATO, we've achieved something, Minsk too? 
Um, well, uh, absolutely. And uh, that was um, something that um, the United States, Germany, uh, the NATO allies in Europe were trying to implement and uh, implement uh, very often in the Russian uh, in the Russian version of the agreements, the, the way how Russia read those agreements. The key sticking point there was what should come first in the um, in the, the implementation of the Minsk agreements, either elections on the territory controlled by Russia or Ukraine taking control of its own borders and then conducts elections on the basis of its of its uh, laws and 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 under under its control. Russia insisted on elections first under the Russian control, military control, and then taking these regions, using them as Trojan horse, putting them into the body of the uh, uh, political body of Ukraine, and really destabilizing Ukraine, uh, precluding the situation in which Ukraine would be able to apply to the European Union, to try to get closer to the West, to NATO, that was the plan, and for a while it was backed by, by uh, leading countries in, in NATO because the, the idea was, uh, well, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't too far from the policies of appeasement of the 1930s. Yes, they went along with a fragmented Ukraine, which is exactly 1930s. More Aust more Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland than Austria, but in any event, the predator, Moscow, was given permission because there was no cost. So it's now 2015, and there appears to be stability, although I said there was an artillery war for the next seven years. We need to turn to the events of 2021-2022 to understand how how poorly NATO responded to Russian provocations. The professor's book is The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of Histories. Serhii Ploki is the author. The spring of 2021, the summer of 2021, Russia continues to run troops up to the Ukrainian border and then pull back, but leaves its equipment in place. There's talk back and forth between now President Biden and Vladimir Putin. They meet in Geneva. There t there's talks by the director of the Central Intelligence Agency in Moscow warning Putin not to do this and, talk and Putin talking about his demands. There's taunting going on in Ukraine all that spring, summer, and fall of 2021. But Mr. Biden makes it clear again and again, the professor reporting, that no U.S. troops are going to Ukraine. No weapons are going to Ukraine. Professor, this is a colossal misjudgment of Putin. Was it purposeful? Did it serve NATO's purpose to pretend that Putin wasn't a deceiver and a predator? Uh, the uh, U.S. intelligence did a fantastic job really um, reporting to Washington uh, uh, on the mood in the Kremlin, on the plans for the war, uh, even predicting, if, if not the day and the hour, then at least the week when the war would start. And the uh, uh, Mr. Biden's administration in, in uh, the White House made an unprecedented move of releasing almost in real time the intelligence information on those things that they were getting. So the hope was that they would shame Putin into into not doing that, into not attacking, almost to trick him into saying that, okay, you told that I would attack and I would prove you wrong. My understanding that was at least part, part of the thinking behind the idea of release this information in real time. But what was not happening was not, uh, there was very little uh, acting on the basis of that of that information in terms of helping Ukraine to um, withstand the uh, possible and very certain in, in, in the eyes of the American intelligence attack. Uh, 
that indeed came in February of 2022. So the plans were, or the expectations were that um, there probably would be a partisan warfare in Ukraine, but the key would fall within a few days. Ukraine probably would fall within a week or two. And that was uh, that was a colossal uh, misjudgment, um, uh, underestimating the capacity of the Ukrainian state, Ukrainian army to fight back and re resolve of the Ukrainian people, and overestimating the capacity of the Russian army to win on the on the battlefield. So we have here really, really a mixed bag with uh, again both go to the to the strengths and weaknesses of of intelligence uh, gathering and then and then intelligence uh, producing intelligence estimates and predictions. There's a new president in Ukraine at this point. You know him well, President Zelensky. He's elected in the spring of 2019, overwhelming favorite, seventy three percent man to fight corruption, which is preying upon the people of Ukraine. However, what's important to understand at this point is that Vladimir Putin is building an argument to his people, to the Russian people, why he's going to do this. He talks about the historical unity of Russians and Ukraines as one people, a single whole. What's he, what's he mean by that, Professor? He goes back to the uh, ideas and writings of the Russian intellectuals of the 19th century, of the Russian imperial intellectuals, who believed back then that Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians constituted one nation. Uh, that belief was certainly absolutely misplaced. By the beginning of the 20th century, we see the declaration of Ukrainian independence, we see the Bolsheviks trying to accommodate a Ukrainian desire for independence by creating not one uh, centralized uh, Russian state, but the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. We would not have the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic in the 20th century if there would be no Ukraine. And what Putin really uh, believes in and was trying and still is trying to do is turn the clock of history back to the Russian imperial ideas, to the Russian empire of the 19th century. And uh, this is not just something that he was putting forward for propaganda purposes. This is something that he really believes in. And he built the entire campaign of 2022 on the foundation of that belief on this absolute misreading of history, uh, because the expectation was that um, 150,000 troops, maybe 200,000 troops would be enough to overrun Ukraine as part of the um, police operation, really, so-called special military operation. There was a belief that uh, Ukrainians, because they are allegedly Russians, would welcome Russian troops with flowers, and uh, Ukrainians welcomed Russian troops with the uh, weapons, with some of their own production, some that were supplied by the United States and allies, mostly mostly of, of uh, javelins and, and stingers of the sort that the uh, Mujahideens in Afghanistan were receiving back in the 1980s. So the presumption was this contest could be discouraged by javelins and stingers. Was that at that point with the were they fatalist about Putin? I note that Zelensky was attempting to use Macron and others. You're reporting to negotiate with Moscow. There was one meeting between Putin and Zelensky. Does this mean that Putin the whole time did not intend uh, his meetings, his conversations? is uh, leaning into the idea of a negotiated settlement. That was all a ploy because he was still committed to the idea that we need all of Ukraine or at least the southern portion and the eastern portion. So the, that he was deceiving all those meetings? Uh, Putin's um, idea, and that's the main reason why the war started in 2014, was to stop Ukraine's drift toward the West and include Ukraine into the Russia-controlled sphere of influence, the so-called Eurasian Union. 
And that's that's the um, goal was there in back in 2014, the goal in 2022, and I'm convinced it is still the goal today and now. Plan B is dismembering Ukraine if plan A doesn't work. And Putin's hope for President Zelensky, who had no political experience before being elected, uh, was was uh, a comedian, um, very successful, very successful uh, in that sense. The idea was that Mr. Zelensky would accept Mr. Putin's interpretations of Minsk agreements. I see. Would implement them the way how Putin wanted them to be implemented. And in that way, actually, Ukraine would become ungovernable. Once Mr. Zelensky told to Mr. Putin during their meeting in Paris. We have 30 seconds, would, Professor. 30 seconds. Go ahead. Uh, in Paris, that he was not prepared to do that. Many observers believe, and I agree with them, that after that, after the December of 2019, that's where the countdown to the current war starts. It is February 24th, 2022. Vladimir Putin takes to the airwaves a TV address to announce what we now understand is the new, the second invasion of Ukraine. 4 a.m. assault will turn to President Zelensky when he hears the gunfire. This is the Russo-Ukrainian War, the return of history. Serhii Ploki is the author. President Zelensky is awakened by explosions, gunfire. He immediately recognizes that the world has changed everything. Russia has now no longer coming up to the border and threatening, intimidating. It is invading Ukraine, and it means to take the capital. We know now that it means to do much more than that. This is not warfare as we understand it. This is to destroy the will of more than 40 million people. And very likely, there is plenty of evidence to assassinate the president of the country. I'm with Serhii Ploki, the professor of Ukrainian history and director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. His new book, The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History. All the precedents are in place now for, for Vladimir Putin and his army to brutalize and dismember and horrify the people of Ukraine over the next days in a quick victory in which, according to Vladimir Putin, they will be celebrated as liberators. Professor, your book is very convincing in that the imagination of Vladimir Putin is a deal of the story that the Russian people accept and that the Russian army accepts. Do I say all that correctly, that they, they believed two or three days? They believed liberation. They believed his neo-Nazi talk, did they? Uh, absolutely, they they did, and to a great degree, they still do. Uh, uh, the war is very often called uh, um, Putin's war, and it is very difficult to overestimate really the importance of one individual and his ideas and his own uh, phobias and his um, phobias of the West, his misunderstanding of the history of Russia and Ukraine. But he has been supported by the Russian public when he annexed the Crimea. The annexation of the Crimea put his approval ratings through the roof. And uh, the plan was certainly to have another uh, little war, a victorious war, that would provide more, not just more territory for, for uh, Russia, but also uh, provide more legitimacy for the uh, dictatorial regime of Vladimir Putin. So it is not just Putin's war, it is Russia's war uh, as well. And that is reflected in the title of my book. But uh, that being said, of course, uh, not just Mr. Putin, but also his commanders and uh, soldiers um, in, the, in the units that crossed the Ukrainian border on the early morning of February 24, 2022. They were all up for a surprise. They were all up for a surprise. They, the army itself was the victim of the uh, Russian propaganda. 
they believed what Putin and propaganda um, talking heads were saying that Ukraine was the country that was captured by nationalists and by um, uh, heirs of Hitler and and neo Nazis, and uh, somehow it didn't it didn't uh, register the fact that that was unlike Russia, a democratic country that that wasn't continues to be the only country in the world outside of Israel that is run by the by the president of the Jewish background. And um, uh, we, we are talking really about, we, we draw parallels before between um, Anschluss and annexation of the Crimea, Sudetenland and situation in Eastern Ukraine. There is uh, another very, very important and a, 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 I think useful uh, parallel. It's between the uh, German society, the way how it was brainwashed by the Nazi regime back in the 1930s and was in support of Hitler and the Russian society of today. So uh, the, we, we, have, uh, we have this um, uh, 20 years, more than 20 years of uh, either authoritarian or dictatorial regime, and it uh, it made a major impact on on the Russian society as a whole. Not only Moscow expected a quick victory, so did Washington, and the president notably offered Mr. Zelensky an exit to his country to go into exile, something like the Polish government in 1939. Zelensky said no, and the professor identifies two men I I'm just meeting for the first time who President Zelensky turned to, to defend Kiev, Colonel General Alexander Sirsky and General, and I struggle with the name, Krasilnikov on the Northern flank. Did they believe it was going to last two or three days, General, uh, pr Professor, or were they better informed about their ability to resist? Um, they, uh, those were the generals who went through the first stage of the war back in 2014, 2015. Uh, they, they had an experience, a bitter experience of, of mostly, mostly losing and retreating. But uh, they uh, really used the eight years between 2014 and 2022 to build up army and to build their confidence. What uh, they didn't expect was that it would be an all-out war. What they expected was that the war would start in the east of the country, in the um, Donbass area, and uh, attack on Kyiv, the missile attack, massive missile attack on different areas of Ukraine and different targets on the first early morning of the invasion, that came as a surprise to them. So they they knew that they would fight. They were preparing for that fight. Their fortifications are still standing near the city of Donetsk. Russians were never uh, were able to break through them. What they didn't expect that the attack would come from the north, that the attack would come through the areas like the Chernobyl exclusion zone. That caught them by surprise. We need to speak of Chernobyl because the professor illustrates what happened at Chernobyl. We're watching again at Zaporizhia, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. And there is no conclusion here. It's my observation, professor, that Moscow planned this war as recklessly as imaginable in order to use those two plans, Chernobyl first and then uh, now Zaporizhia as either leverage, bargaining chips, the nuclear card, all of the above. I believe Medvedev, whom you question his sanity when he's drinking, Medvedev has talked about Zaporizhia as a nuclear card. It is a surprise to me that there's not been more collective horror to understand how reckless Moscow is. Certainly Ukraine knows it. What is the status of Chernobyl today, because the Russians pulled back to Belarus, but it's still vulnerable. Uh, Chernobyl was liberated uh, as the result of the successful counteroffensive by Ukrainian forces around Kyiv. Uh, 
Ukraine won the battle for Kyiv in late March of 2022, and as the result of that, Chernobyl was, was liberated. Uh, in fact, I just finished the first draft of my next book, and it will be on the Russian occupation of Chernobyl, the 35 days of the occupation. And it started the same way the uh, accident in Chernobyl in 1986 started from recklessness. The idea was that no one expects the Russian troops marching toward Kyiv, and especially marching toward Kyiv through the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And that's what we would do for the, uh, in order, that was the, the closest way, the shortest way to get for Russian troops from Belarus to Kyiv. But once they, once they captured Chernobyl, what they uh, did, they really used it as a shield. They used it for military purposes as a shield against, against uh, possible uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive. And we see the same situation with the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, except that in Zaporizhia, the crisis was much, much more serious. Unlike in Chernobyl, where the Ukrainian National Guards, who protected the station, decided not to fight back because of the concern for the safety of the entire continent. In Zaporizhia, the Ukrainian National Guards actually fought back, and Russians used missiles, Russians used tanks to take over the site of the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. This is not just recklessness, it's outright criminality. And we are with Chernobyl and Zaporizhia, we are in a different era. This is for the first time in history that the nuclear sites are used as, as a weapon in the conventional war. And uh, I personally believe that this, is, this should serve as a wake up call to the international community as a whole because everyone has been concerned about the use of the nuclear weapons. But it's much easier for aggressor to create an accident at the nuclear power plant with some uh, deniability of what happened or blame the other side. But the impact, the impact could be the same or impact could be even worse than the impact of the nuclear, nuclear uh, bomb, explosion of the nuclear bomb. This is this is a very important aspect of the war that I don't think gets enough attention. The Russo-Ukrainian War, the return of history, Serhii Ploki, Kiev holds the revelations of the war crimes at Bucha shock the world, including the Western leaders who are reluctant at this point to commit themselves to defending Ukraine through the sacrifice and the boldness of. Mr. Zelensky and the Ukrainian army. However, we need to turn to the three parts of the story that are now in place and continuing. Remember the professor, this is the first year of the war, but geography doesn't change. The Eastern Front, that's uh, the Dnieper and the Eastern part of the country to the Russian border. The Black Sea Front, that's from Crimea, through Kherson, Mykolaiv, and Odessa. That's the southern portion where the Ukraine, where Ukraine would ship its grain if the Russians permitted it. And then the counteroffensive and the recapture of Kharkiv. All wonderful stories, great amount of detail. But I want to go to two, two particular events in these three. One, the steel of Azov, the holdout at Maritopol by elements of the Azov battalion and volunteers. Again, the Russians continue to be surprised, Professor. They were surprised it wasn't over in two or three days. They only gave their troops food enough for two or three days. So we had young Russian soldiers marauding around in bake shops in some of the cities they ran through. And then we come to the battle at Mar Mariupol over the steel of Azov. That surprised them as well, correct? They they didn't expect the, the Ukrainians wouldn't run. They didn't. And the resilience showed by the fighters of Azov uh, came as a surprise uh, also to me when I was writing the book. Because within the first few days, they were in complete encirclement. But they continued to fight. 
And more than that, members of the Azov Battalion that were outside of Mariupol volunteered to be uh, brought by helicopters to the to Azov and and, and fight there. And uh, that that was really a sort of determination that became a symbol of, of Ukrainian resilience in general, and certainly caught caught uh, uh, Russians by surprise. And uh, the uh, Azov uh, bata uh, battalion, they started as battalion back in 2014. They became a regiment, part of the National Guards units uh, under the Ministry of Interior. They, uh, together with other units, um, the regular army units, they defended uh, Mariupol since uh, late February of 2022 until late May of uh, the same year, so in complete, in complete isolation. Um, so really the, the, the uh, defense of Mariupol that was uh, almost completely destroyed, only after that it was captured, became a symbol of Ukrainian resistance worldwide. Credit. I, that time I was in Vienna and I saw graffiti all over the city about about the the heroism of uh, members of the Azov Azov regiment. Credit to the mayor of Kherson, Ihor Kalik Kaev is my pronunciation. Yes, pretty close. Yes, uh, because he wouldn't agree. That's a, that's why he did something simple. He said no, and the again the Russians were not prepared for a civil leader, civic leader to defy them. They replaced so many of the mayors, um, but it's a measure of the Black Sea front that the Russians were not prepared for one, that the that the Ukrainians would fight for bridges, and two, that the mayors would cooperate and turn their whole region into a defense mechanism. That's why the Russians didn't get any farther than Mikolaev. I wondered about that in, early in the war. Did you as well, Professor, why they just didn't drive their tanks, tanks all the way to Odessa? They certainly tried to do that. Uh, they tried to get through Mikolaev. They couldn't. They tried to bypass the city, go to another nuclear power plant, the southern Ukrainian nuclear power plant. They were stopped there. And they were stopped as the result of really unique, unprecedented cooperation between the armed forces and the territorial defense units and the city and, and civil administration. The uh, mayors of the cities and, and towns and small villages emerged as really heroes in that war because the expectation on the Russian side was that the people of Ukraine were alienated from their own leadership, that they would not, would not do that, that they would not support their mayors, they would not support their president. And uh, uh, the president refused to leave the people, refused to leave the capital. We talked about that, Mr. Zelensky. And the same was true for, for the mayors of uh, major cities. So as at, at the end of the day, they were targeted. Either they were killed, as was the case uh, um, around Bucha, north of Kiev, or they were kidnapped, as was the case with Mr. Kolehai. We still don't know where where he is. Uh, the same was true with the mayors of other cities in south uh, of Ukraine. All of those cities are Russian-speaking cities. In right. Mariupol, 44% of the population were ethnic Russians, but they didn't want Russian army on their territory. The, bo the book is The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History. Serhii Ploki is the author. It is now The Return of History. It is now the spring summer of 2022. The Ukrainians having blunted the Russian assumption that they would run away and are now on the offensive and the weapons start showing up. The weapons from NATO, weapons from the NATO stores at Rammstein. The Americans are driving this, but as we see, there are other voices weighing in, surprised voices from places that we need to touch upon because the professor calls this chapter the return of the West. The US was reluctant at first to do more than give Mr. Zelensky refuge. Now it is pouring its weapon systems in, bigger and bigger, but always cautious. 
There's always the reservation that this could lead to a lot wider war. Vladimir Putin is bluffing or boasting of his nuclear weapons. I want to attend to Germany. You will recall that Angela Merkel, the chancellor of the Germans, was at the Minsk one and two meetings of 2014, 2015, and was seen as an interlocutor between Putin and the West. She speaks Russian, having raised in East Germany. He speaks German, having been assigned there. But now there's a new leader in Germany, Olaf Scholz of the coalition. He's a socialist Democrat. And he, he surprisingly makes a speech called Zeitenwende just days after the war starts. Professor, were you surprised by Zeitenwende? And are you surprised that Germany, with a slow start, finally got into the war? Uh, I was surprised on two counts. First of all, I was surprised by the uh, Zeidenwand uh, um, term and paradigm. That means a global shift, global shift in policy. Uh, and it was uh, announced, the new policy was announced at an uh, unprecedented meeting of the uh, German parliament that was taking place over the weekend. Uh, and that was really a rhetorically a major shift away from uh, Angela Merkel, who had a very different vision of um, awarding really Putin after Georgia, uh, invasion of Georgia with Nord Stream 1 and after Crimea with Nord Stream 2. So that was my first surprise. Dramatic shift, dramatic change in rhetoric. And then came my second surprise that very little followed those pronouncements. Really, the hope, the way how I understand it of Olaf Scholz, Olaf Scholz and others around him was that, well, the declaration would be there, but the war probably would end within a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months. And uh, the, uh, there will be no need to, to implement that major dramatic change. And uh, Mr. Schultz reacted to very strong, for the lack of a better word, pro-Russian group within his own party, within, within Social Democratic Party. Uh, so what we see from Germany is actually very slow, very slow uh, change. What one can also say, being slow, it is also quite profound. Um, and uh, we we witness really a new phenomenon in the world today, with Germany uh, really becoming much more active, and also in military terms, um, in the in the international politics. And on the other side of the world, Japan Japan uh, adopts a much more proactive position, including making a decision at the end to supply weapons to Ukraine. This didn't happen yet, but they're on the way of doing that. So we are in a, in a world that on the one level reminds us of the Cold War and transatlantic alliance that was rebuilt, but it's also a different role that Germany and Japan are either playing or are preparing to play in this new global order. There's much attention to the so-called counteroffensive here in 2023, but we need to record a victory that was the counteroffensive in 2022. This is the late summer, early fall of 2022. And if I understand, again, General Sersky is on the scene, a man who will have to learn much more of in future the decisions he made in the early part of the war. And here, the Russians had taken the eastern part of the country, including the second largest city, Kharkiv. Professor, help me if I get this wrong. I'm just going as fast as I can. Sure, sure. No. The okay. Russians were counting on the Ukrainians not being able to launch a counteroffensive, or where would it be? They assumed it would be towards, uh, in the south, Kherson or Zaporizhia. No, instead, what the Ukrainians did with the weapons they had at the time, it wasn't sufficient. There are much more bigger weapons coming. They surprised the Russians and retook Kharkiv, the second largest city, a major victory for the Ukrainians, a major victory for the uh, for the those who believed in Kiev. And at this point, Professor, I've stopped numbering how many times the Russians are surprised 
you have evidence, however, perhaps a reason why. At a place called Balaklia, the Russian officers run away from their own men. So we're, we're looking at a specific example in the Kharkiv off a counteroffensive where the Russian army was broken. And this is the summer of 22, correct? It didn't take another it, year. It is the fall. It is September of 2022. And uh, Ukrainians retaken part of Kharkiv re region, the city, the, the city they were able to hold. Uh, it never fell into the Russian hands, but part of the Kharkiv region they lost, and now they they reclaimed it in in September counteroffensive of 2022. And when the Russians ran away, we you left us behind, you got out, said the the soldiers of Russia, and this is during the mobilizations, where the Russian army is bringing in new recruits, and a man named Prigozhin is. Or finding recruits in criminal penal colonies, the war is becoming increasingly uh, savage on the Ukraine on the Russian side. They keep being defeated by their own expectations, and the U.S. remains cautious. This is the fall, the summer and fall of 2022. Putin, however, is he's he's like a wind-up doll that you whenever you need him on stage, he comes out and sings his arias for the opera. He starts blaming the West. What does he mean by the West? What 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 does that mean to the Russian people, the West? Well, the uh, mm, mm, dictatorships are mm, especially effective when they have an outside foreign enemy that provides explanation and legitimization why there is no democracy, it provides uh, excuse for the um, um, further uh, and further curtailing of whatever democratic rights have been left in, in the country, in, in any country, Russia or any other. So you need uh, to, to be a good and successful uh, dictator and last for as long as Mr. Putin lasts, you have, you have a very well-developed image of the enemy, and uh, it's the West and NATO in particular that performs that uh, role in Russian propaganda. Uh, we know that uh, this is this is basically um, a, a shame and excuse. The war on Ukraine started allegedly be because Ukraine would be accepted into NATO, and everyone was saying that um, it, it wasn't in the cards for Ukraine at that time. And when Finland and uh, Finland in particular joined NATO, Mr. Putin didn't remove one single soldier from Ukraine and didn't send uh, those soldiers to defend the long 100 kilometers frontier with the new NATO country. So he doesn't expect NATO to attack. But NATO is there, the West is there as a quintessential uh, age old enemy and threat to the to to the russian society to uh, to the to the russians as a whole so we are dealing here with the propaganda and propaganda that unfortunately um, uh, unfortunately works in russia another world leader who has to be watched carefully because he often is outside of conventional wisdom this is Emmanuel Macron, the twice elected president of France, who early on in this contest, while he was president, sought to be a peacemaker, a negotiator, an interlocutor with Vladimir Putin. This, in addition to Mr. Macron's ambition to set up what the professor reports as a new security structure and appeal to Putin in some fashion. Mario Draghi of Italy at the time was also seeking a similar accommodation, but he's no longer leading Italy. Macron is still leading France. Professor, has Macron come to a different understanding than, of Vladimir Putin than he started the war with, or is he still hoping for Putin to listen to a uh, peace talk? Uh, uh, Macron was um, one of those European leaders who really um, tried very hard to position himself as intermediary between Putin and the West. 
uh, as an independent player, uh, he continued in the long-standing French tradition of some sort of opposition toward, uh, toward the United States and United States policy in Europe in particular. And uh, unlike others, he didn't give up on that, on that uh, role even after the uh, all-out Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022. But he uh, was turned uh, turned uh, down again and again by Vladimir Putin uh, during the first months of the war. And by June of 2022, he and Olaf Scholz and uh, Mario Draghi of Italy, eventually they, they um, realized the, the impossibility of... Uh, uh, their role as intermediaries and negotiators. That role went to uh, another uh, um, authoritarian leader in the region, and that was President Erdogan of Turkey. So since the summer of the last year, what we see is that France and other European countries are solidly in the US-led uh, coalition in support of Ukraine. And I would say that um, sometimes they uh, outdo U.S. Uh, in that regard. That was certainly the case uh, with the Vilnius NATO summit in July of this year when uh, Macron, um, feeling quite secure after elections, winning elections, declared that he was for uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO when the United States actually was not uh, prepared to make commitments of that kind. The book is The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History. Serhiy Ploky is the author. Vladimir Putin was in Beijing for the Winter Olympics in the February of 22. And conversation with, with Xi Jinping, we can speculate, he informed him of the intention to invade again Ukraine and fragment it or destroy it, overrun it. Professor... Xi Jinping is opaque. I understand that. But right now, taking into account the disappointment and the overreach of Russia, has this in some fashion changed China? Has the war in Ukraine meant that there's less likelihood of a Taiwan invasion or more likelihood in your measure? Um, the war in Ukraine demonstrated that um, the uh, special so-called special military operations of the sort that Putin planned for Ukraine can turn out into prolonged wars and uh, become, become the uh, centerpieces of major international crisis. And uh, the only signal that it can send to Xi Jinping or to anybody in the world that um, the uh, um, this military adventures are really unpredictable. If Ukraine was able to defend itself so effectively, one can only imagine how effective can be Taiwan given the unity within the society, determination to stay de facto independent, and the preparations, military preparations that this country is involved actually for decades now. So you know, I can't imagine uh, that uh, the, the, uh, what happens in Ukraine is encouraging those in Beijing who would want to use uh, military, uh, military option to deal with Taiwan. I think that um, by resisting the Russian aggression, uh, Ukrainians contributed to the um, uh, some form of uh, stability uh, in the in uh, East Asia as well, and in that part of the Pacific. You write trenchantly, this is a 19th century war with 20th century tactics and 21st century weapons. Right now, we're observing in the fog of war what those weapon systems, the ones that have been delivered, mean to the Ukrainians. At the same time, there's a battle, there's an, itty, there's an idea battle going on that is constant in the themes of the book that the professor reports, which is, is this the Westphalian understanding of nation states with sovereignties, or is this empires with spheres of influence? 
I believe Moscow sees this as empires with spheres of influence. How does NATO see it? How does NATO understand what it's fighting for, Professor? Well, one thing that uh, is uh, very clear, I, uh, you mentioned that I'm writing about this war as 19th century war. What I have in mind is that the ideology behind this war is 19th century empire. So this is, this is if not rebuilding an empire itself, then certainly it's rebuilding the Russian sphere of influence. For NATO, the war is uh, basically about the international order. Uh, with the annexation of the Crimea, we had the first case in history since World War II of the annexation in Europe of territory of one country by another. And uh, it's also about the protection of its eastern flank, and I mean uh, countries like the Baltic states, Poland, and uh, checking, checking the aggression that now it's very clear for everybody that it will not be limited just to Chechnya. It is not limited by now already to Georgia. And we know it is not limited to Ukraine with the Russian participation in Syria and in the Middle East. We are dealing with not just European, but global challenge that comes from Russia. And uh, NATO is there rediscovering its purpose of defending, of defending the international order and democracy in Europe and uh, globally, maybe it's, it's not about democracy, but in Europe, this is certainly also the war between democracy and autocracy. So um, rebuilding transatlantic alliance that also meaning NATO going back to the basics of its uh, political philosophy, but also its military philosophy. The sanctions regime and the flooding of cash, rubles on the Russian people are pointing to a, an economy that will be in distress for not years, decades, uh, damaging the lives of the Russian people. And that will weigh upon Europe if, if and when there's an end to this. I'm trying to find a positive seam here for Russia, Professor, but I believe that Vladimir Putin has destroyed his own country's future. Is that a fair measure, a future by the next 20 years? Is that a fair measure? We have 30 seconds. Um, yes, I think that uh, the the uh, damage that Putin and his regime is is doing to Russia now will, will last for, for a long period of time, maybe maybe for generations. The silver lining is that after this war, I really uh, can't imagine Russia being able to fight another aggressive war for a relatively long period of time. And I hope that this is the war that will be a turning point in Russian history and Russian rethinking itself, not as empire or the former empire, but a new modern state. So I am still optimistic long term. The Russo-Ukrainian War, The Return of History. Serhii Ploki is the author. I'm John Batchelor.